Ethnic and African American Studies. He makes the link, folks. And and when I heard this, I was like, wow, I'm just going to make a link. So that's what really uh, intrigued me. And he really has made that link. Again, thank you, Dr. Patterson. Thank you. All right, folks, the, the classroom uh, edition continues. This time now we welcome Neely Fuller, Jr. to the head of the class. Neely Fuller, Jr., welcome back to WOL Radio. Thank you. You know, there's been a lot of talk about this Black Lives Matter, whether it's a slogan or, or whether it's it's a movement. Uh, I just want to get your thoughts on, on Black Lives Matter, because uh, some people are saying it, it, black li- it only matters when a black person is killed or, or, or when a white person kills a black person, but it doesn't matter when, when a black person kills another black person. Uh, how do you view it so far? Because I know you've heard it in the news. Well, it's not a matter of either or. It's a matter of both and all. If, if you're going to have a movement, where are you moving from and what are you moving to? And what is that going to look like? Everything must be measured. Everything that we do every day is about measurements. And measurements toward what? Toward the way that everything ought to be. So it shouldn't be an abstraction, just, just another slogan. Like all during the 1960s, we had... Black power, black power, black power, black power. And people at some point asked the logical question. Uh, I heard people asking the question. I asked the question, what exactly does that mean? What does that mean? And for what purpose? In other words, if you want to make black people powerful, powerful in order to do what? And what is the result going to look like? See, we must get in the habit of what I call codification, which means everything that we do should be for a reason, and we should be able to envision. Somebody used that word vision a lot, and I've come to pay a lot of attention to it. Uh, Martin Luther King called it a dream and whatnot, and then he spelled out a few ingredients, but then you got to go into the details. What will that look like? So if you say black lives matter, matter how, matter to whom, when, where, in what ways, in all ways, well, somebody might say, sure, they matter in every way, not just in one or two ways, they matter in every way. Okay, matter to whom, when, where, how, put the filling in the pies, not just, we just keep making crusts with no pie, nothing inside, just a crust. And this is when a uh, so-called movement just becomes just an abstract slogan, and it continues that way. And you're correct when you say that, well, do black lives matter when black people kill black people? Well, we'll get to that later. I mean, we'll, you know, but we got to, you know, no, no, do it all at one time. Why not do that? Why not even raise, why not raise the question? Why not do it all at one time? Which means, if they're going to matter, how are you going to go about make, making it matter? Or you, do you have a procedure? Do you have a plan that you can put in operation right this minute? I mean, we need to answer a lot of questions when we start making statements like Black Lives Matter. And so... Well, let me ask you this. Do you think it was done deliberately like that to sort of leave it in the abstract? No, don't don't leave anything in the abstract. That, that's just like making, you know, lay, laying out a blueprint without explaining anybody to anybody what the blueprint is supposed to mean, and no buildings ever go up. But you've got a blueprint. You say, well, well we got the solutions, all right. We got the solutions. I mean, we're, we're working on it. We're really working on it. I mean, you know, and we just about got it completed, and... uh this is the solution. Well, you don't have a solution until you have a solution, meaning whatever it is, the problem that you're trying to solve is solved. You don't have a solution to a problem that's not solved. You can't declare a solution. You say, well, we got it on paper. No. <laughs> Everybody's got a lot of stuff on paper. But have you solved the problem? Whatever it was, if there was a fire down the block, have you actually put out the fire, the house fire? The house caught a fire. Now, you have a plan for putting out the fire. We're going to put a fire plug there. We're going to see to it 
that the uh, fire department gets there on time, and uh, we got a plan for putting out the fire. But if the house burned down and all the houses on the block keep burning down, you don't have a plan. And your, all of your problems would not mean nothing. All of your the information you've given to the fire department about, you know, how long it's going to take to get through these narrow streets to put out a fire and all that's been worked out. But the houses keep burning down. Now, these things keep happening. We've had the Black Lives uh, slogan here for a little while now. Enough for someone to say, what do you do when you're pulled over? And this should be emphasized and drummed into people's heads over and over again. I have said three things. Don't argue. Don't fight. Don't run. Now, you might get killed anyway. I've said that, too. But that should be the first three things in your mind. Don't argue. Don't argue under any circumstance. Don't argue. Don't fight. Don't run. And you just might add, uh, don't resist in a way that which would include not fighting and whatnot. But, I mean, if you're told to do something, do it. Get out of the car. You're in your Sunday's best. You're on your way to church. You're dressed up. And the officer says, get out of the car and get down on the ground. Now, it's a rainy day and it's muddy. You do exactly what you're told. We're in a war. This is not a playground. This is not a dispute among a few children in kindergarten. But a lot of us, truth be told, act like we're still in kindergarten. We you know, I want to go back to that scenario old. that you just painted about in your Sunday best and it's raining and the cop tells you to, to lay down in the mud. One of the things they'd like to do with the, the, the police departments, especially in L.A., when it's hot, they want you to lay across the hood of the car when it's, when it's you know, it's it's boiling hot. They, they, they require you to get on the hood. And it's hot. And, and if you don't, they smash your head down and then they, 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 you know, cuff you for resisting arrest. Would you would you uh, advise the same situation? I would advise the same situation because I look at myself as what I am. I'm a prisoner of war. I'm in the system of white supremacy. That's the dominant government on this planet. And I'm the target of that government. Every black person has to have that semen in his or her head. Oh, right. Hold that thought right, right there. I'll let you finish up on the other side. Folks, you can join the class. Reach out to us. Our guest and teacher is Neely. And thank you for staying with us, folks. We're 20 minutes after the hour with our guest, Neely Fuller Jr. He's deciphering the Black Lives Matter slogan for us. And also tell us how to survive in a white supremacist world. That's the world we live in right now, Neely Fuller Jr. And before the break, you were telling us to give him those two scenarios uh, about uh, you stop by the police and you're in your Sunday best and he tells you to spread them and you got down in the mud or... If you're in, 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 a, in a warm climate community, or they do it in, in Los Angeles, they like to do this a lot. The police stop you and they tell you to, to you know, spread out on, on the hood of the car. It's 100 degrees uh, hot sun. And if you refuse, they slam your face down and then they, they snatch you for resisting arrest. So would you still still uh, advise people to, do, to behave that would do whatever they say, Dr. Fuller? Yes, sir, because you look at it like you are what, the, if, if the person is not a police officer, because I say there's a distinction between a police officer and a race soldier. A race soldier is a white supremacist pretending to be a police officer. We, we need to change the language because you have a lot of people who, you know, elderly people who will say, I just called the police. Why do they keep beating up on the police? I, uh, these boys around here in my neighborhood are breaking in my house every week, and I call the police every week. And I want the police to do something because they just stand around and write uh, all kind of reports and whatnot, but these boys right around here in the neighborhood keep breaking in my house. So who are you going to call when they do that? Nobody's stopping them from doing it. They think that it's funny, and you know, and this you got thousands of people who are saying this. And at the same time, we'll say, no, don't call the police because the police are brutal. Now, we can't have it both ways. 
So we have to distinguish what's going on here. Now, if you've got a race soldier, a race soldier is going to act like a race soldier. A race soldier, and I say you don't call them names, so you say suspected race soldier. If the person is white, the person may be a race soldier. That's the way you look at it. And let's distinguish between a race soldier and a police officer. A police officer will do the correct thing. A race soldier won't. A race soldier is an infiltrator of the law enforcement establishment who is intent on expressing his or her racism by using the uniform, the badge, and the gun. So when you in, see, in, that, in that vein, then, what do you call the black police officer who behaves similarly? Oh, well, he's just imitating the race soldier, okay, because the race soldier has to be white, okay? And he's also expressing the what he considers to be, this black person, what he thinks or she thinks that the greater society wants in their performance. Law enforcement officers... I've been in law enforcement. I've also, when I was in uh, Korea, they said that that was a police action. They didn't call it a war. People who remember it, it was called a police action. This is not a war. And you are a police officer, and you will conduct yourself as a police officer in these hills of North Korea, firing these guns and whatnot. And then flying through, I mean, in helicopters and all the rest of it, we would call a police action. You know, you can put a label on almost anything, but you look at what's actually going on, okay? So you conduct yourself the way that you are told to do. Now, these law enforcement officers are told things, either directly or indirectly. And indirectly, in many cases, when you have this Black Lives Matter coming to the surface, it's because there is a system of white supremacy backing it up, saying black lives don't matter. And this is when you get the black person who is shot down on the run by a suspected race soldier or by a black person copying after what he or she thinks. This is what the society wants. This is what they hired me for to kill these black people out here. What do you think that I'm doing? I'm not just out here doing stuff. I mean, this is this is what they hired me for. This is what they want me to do, and I'm going to do it. Now, when we send those kind of signals, this is why we have to change the entire society if we're really serious about this Black Lives Matter, because I have written down over and over again as a reminder to myself, Black Lives Matter, White Lives Matter, all lives matter. And then I'll say, if this is true, what do you have to do if we are making a true statement and we're going to act on that true statement? You have to replace the entire system of white supremacy with justice. Otherwise, we're going to keep having this happen over and over again, like we are witnessing over and over again anyway. Because where does it all come down to? It comes down to a jury. And when black people start demonstrating in the street and, and, and rioting and burning and looting, it's usually as a result. If we were to think about it, walk through all these cases, it's a result of a jury decision, not what actually happened at the scene of the so-called police brutality. It was the jury decision, sometimes the change of venue and all like that, like in the Rodney King case. That's what set off the riots. The riots didn't happen immediately after people saw the tape of Rodney King being beaten. The riots happened much later. Just go through the history of it. It was much later, and much later meaning what? Meaning when the jury verdict came in, and they said that I think the man's name, one of the men uh, involved was a Officer Powell. When the jury said, he's not guilty. And the jury was what? They said white for the most part. This is how that decision came in. And that's what set off the Los Angeles riots. If I recall correctly, it's usually after the jury decision comes in. So that means that 
hey, somebody is saying what I saw is okay with me. And who is the somebody? Racist suspects, most likely, because we're in a racist society. We can't keep denying that. So you have to get to the root causes. This Black Lives Matter thing isn't going to matter. As long as you have a number of white people, let's tell it like it is, who are saying it's okay. When white people say it's not okay, it will stop immediately. You better believe black people and white people wearing that badge and gun, they're going to say, hey, I know I'm going to be in big trouble. I'm going to be in big trouble like almost a lynch mob is coming after me. And the lynch mob is going to be legit. It's not going to be people in the streets. I'm going to be losing my house, my family, my future. I'm not going to be out here fooling around, playing with this. They're serious about this. And when you say they, it means the white people of this world are serious about Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, is it a slogan? And how to survive in a white supremacist world? Basically, you're saying, should we acquiesce to anything that white folks tell us to do then? To survive? No, we don't acquiesce to anything. We What we do is say just what I'm saying. Black lives have to matter to the majority of white people. And that's not the case. This is why this keeps happening. Black lives do not matter to the majority of the white people on this planet. And you're going to keep having black people getting gunned down all over the planet not just what you call in law enforcement and all like that, in these so-called wars and all that, as long as black lives don't matter to white people. So we have to get a quality relationship with white people, which means you have to replace the entire system of white supremacy with the system of justice. Now, somebody immediately is going to say, well, I mean, good luck with that happening. Anytime. Right. Hold that thought right there, because I was going to jump in and ask you about that, but now we got to take a quick break. 29 minutes after the hour. Thank you for staying with us, folks. Uh, 32 after the hour, I guess, is Needy Fuller Jr. And i got to tell you this, if you're just hearing me for the first time, Needy Fuller Jr. uses logic to respond to every situation or most situations. Before we left for the break, we were talking about Black Lives Matter, the slogan, and how to survive in a white supremacist world and, and you'll basically so people you you ask the question yourself because i was going to ask you how can we survive in a white supremacist world since they control everything how can we do we need them to ch turn it around we need fuller junior we need an we need a code of behavior that will eliminate i mean and, and make no apologies for that we need to eliminate the entire system of white supremacy which is the most powerful government on the planet all other governments are really null and void. They're non-existent. That's the most, that's the really only government on the planet, the government of racism. Racism is the first consideration, the middle consideration, and the last consideration in all areas of activity of the people of this entire planet. Racism. But, yeah, is but, but, but Neely Fuller Jr., can, can black people alone eradicate racism? No, it has to have the cooperation of all of the people on the planet. And, and, and that includes the white people. If the white people are not going to cooperate, we're going to still have racism because they are the ones, the custodians of the system of white supremacy. You can't have white supremacy without white people. So the white people have not made a determination that ridding the world of racism and replacing it with hypothetically, a better system, which would be justice. And and I had to give a compensatory definition for the word justice because there's no legal definition for it, I've been told. And that is guaranteeing that no person is mistreated anywhere at any time. And number two, guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help. I don't think anybody will come up with a definition that's better than that definition, since the word justice, everybody talks about it, but it hasn't had a definition and doesn't have. If you look at the so-called popular dictionaries of the word justice, it just says something like fair play. Well, fair play, you're talking about fair is white. I mean, so, and, and treating people, you know, just so, a lot of abstractions. But I'm saying, when you say guarantee 
that no person is mistreated. You don't have justice as anybody is being mistreated. I don't care where they are on the planet. If anybody is mis- being mistreated, you don't have justice. You can't chop justice up saying that you have justice in one place, but you don't have it in another place. If you've got injustice anywhere, and it's been said by philosophers and preachers all down through the ages, if you have injustice any place, you don't have it no place. So if somebody's being mistreated, you don't have justice. You have to guarantee that no one is mistreated. And you have to guarantee that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help. And we just, you know, and slogans won't get it. You just have to look and, and see if, if anybody, if it's 10 people in a room, the question is, is anybody in this room being mistreated any kind of way? That's on a job or anything. Is anybody in this room, anybody in this facility, anybody in this factory being mistreated? Well, you don't have justice nowhere in this factory. Now, you better believe that. And if the person who needs help the most is not getting the most constructive help, you don't have justice in that particular setting. I mean, and you don't have it anyway because it's going on on the outside of those walls. But you do the best you can where you are. That's what I mean by we need a code where it governs everybody's behavior. Each and every day. A bunch of folks want to speak to you, Mary Fuller, Jr. 800 450 7876. Go to line two. Eric's in Brooklyn, New York. Eric, you're on with Neely Fuller, Jr. Um, I would say uh, when it comes to the Black Lives Matter, um, I think that the reason why I don't hear people talking about you know black people murdering other black people is because those criminals are usually tried and convicted and receive long sentences. So like you said, with the Rodney King thing, the protest came at the verdict. Uh, so it's, it's at the injustice in the system. So, you know, again, you know, we all got that one young guy down the street or your friend's child that's out doing crimes, and you're like, look, you're going to go to jail for a long time. So we don't we don't have that distrust in the system when it comes to us. And as far as getting pulled over by the police, um, there's a way that you can that you can protest, you know, your, your treatment at the time without arguing um, and with staying in the confines of the law. You want to cooperate. But again, you want to know the law as well. You know, you want to ask, you want to know the right questions to ask. Like if, if you haven't broken the law, you know, you want to ask, am I being detained? Or And then they they have to tell you yes or no. And if they say no, then they have to let you go. So if you, if you have knowledge of the law, there's a way that you can bait a police officer into making a mistake, which will result in a lawsuit for you. And then I have one question. Um... There, there was some recent news that came out. I don't know how recent it is, but it was, you know, there was some news published by Discovery uh, Channel in 2011 uh, by several other sources in 2014 saying that all people that are non-African uh, have a certain percentage of Neanderthal DNA in their system. And my question is, uh, are you aware of this information or if not, uh, do you think that this affects the way, do, do, you, do you think that maybe this could be the reason of the actions of Europeans towards uh you know, or people that are not African, or people that are black, uh, are, are we possibly de- dealing with, you know, something that's not fully human or homo sapien or something that's a different entity than we think it is? All right. Interesting question. Thanks, Eric. I, I, yes. I, I didn't understand the epicenter of that question. Um, what I'm saying is that, all right, say on discovery.com, uh, they're saying that the Neanderthal genome survives in non-African humans. So we're saying are we dealing with uh, a species that, that isn't what we think it is, that's maybe genetically disposed to go to war with us. You know, if you look at bacteria in a microscope, the different types of bacteria destroy each other. So are we, are we actually dealing with something that the same that anybody that's not African, okay, has uh, somewhere between 1.7 and 20% uh, Neanderthal genes. So, you know, uh, again, is this part of the action of, like, supremacy and things like that is the fact that maybe enough study on what these people are, if they are people, hasn't been completed yet. Maybe there's not enough research on what we're dealing with here. Do you think that that could be a possibility? 
Well, if I understand the question, the question is, are people people? Or are they uh, something well, else other than people? Is that the question? Uh, the question is, are non-Africans something else other than people? Because that's what the scientists are saying. They're not, they're not saying they're not people. They're saying there's a, a small percentage of Neanderthal DNA in the non-African, whether they're Asian, European, or what have you. Well, actually, the the way that I have written it in my book, uh, the way that I go at it, and I say it's the truth. So if it's not true, then that that to me will have to be proven to me. There are three. Right, hold hold that people. response there, uh, at Lenny Fuller Jr. We got to take a quick break, and I'll, I'll let you respond. You are well. Can I keep staying with us, folks? So we're 15 away from the top of the hour. I guess the Neely Fuller Jr. And by the way, he's got a book, and um, this short title of the book is called The Code. I'll let you tell him the, the full title because we've got a real long title, and he deals with white supremacy. All right, before we left for the break, Eric from Brooklyn, New York, was asking the question. I guess he made a statement about uh, us being uh, described as, as not less than human, and he wanted to get your response to that. How, how does that fit into your philosophy? Oh, well, according to what I have written, we're talking about categories of people. And when you start talking about categories of people, as far as race is concerned, there's three categories, according to what I have written. And I I lock that in. I don't deviate from that. And this is strictly my opinion, which may not be correct, but this is what I stick with. White people, non-white people, and white supremacists. When you start talking about races of people, and I lock that in, and I don't go outside of those parameters. White people, non-white people, and white supremacists. But in order to be a white supremacist, you have to be classified as white and function as white. And I say these are the three categories. Now, if you go to certain censuses uh, and check through their uh, documentation, it runs up to at, at least... I think now 21 categories of people. When you start talking about races of people, uh, there's even a category called some other race. That's a distinct category. I don't know how you would identify a person when you, you know, if you're a law enforcement officer or you're hiring somebody and you say, well, what, what's the racial category of this person? Or oh, some other race. Okay. Well, what does that person look like who is some other race? Well, it looks like whatever the person looks like. We'll have to bring the person in and look at the person and say, now, this is what some other race looks like. And then you might have five or six people in there, and they don't look anything alike, but you say that they are under the category of some other race. So it's very, very confusing. But in a system of white supremacy, the white supremacists strive off of confusion which is how you get all these different categories. So they'll come up and say, now this person today, this person today was, is a human being. But yesterday, this person wasn't a human being. And day after tomorrow, this person will not be classified as a human being. See, the white supremacists will say anything. So which means we have to have a code that locks in words and their definitions. And you stick with them, regardless of how many changes other people make. The white supremacists are doing all kinds of things with words because they are the masters of words in all of the areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex. They're doing a whole lot in the categories of sex now, changing around all kinds of titles so that you expand the categories of sexuality and whatnot, and then you contract them, and then you scatter them all over the place so that you can't even recognize or you think you can't recognize or you argue about or you're trying to figure out what sex is and what sex is really not. And then they do the same thing in the ninth area of activity, war. And these are the things that I present in the book that I wrote quite a bit, quite a while ago. But the categories are white, non-white, and white supremacists. Don't move outside of those categories. If you do, you're adding to the confusion. Because all right, that's before all we add to the confusion, uh, Neely Fuller, Jenna, tell us the title of the book again, since we're at the book. You can get the book by going to producejustice.com, and what will come up on the screen is a brief description 
for how to order. A brief description of a basic book called a textbook workbook for thought, speech, and our action for victims of white supremacy. And then there's an additional book called a compensatory counter-racist word guide. But there's a basic book and the additional book that's a word guide showing you how to use words, what questions to ask when other people use words. Because the glue that holds the system of white supremacy together is done through words. So you have to study how, the way they manipulate words, which means when you manipulate language, you manipulate the way people think. When you manipulate the way people think, you'll manipulate the way that they will speak and act. And then you have them in a package that you can control. The white supremacists are masters at that. That's how they conquered the entire world of what you might call the non-white categories of people. All right. 800-450-7876. Ten away from the top of the hour. Let's go to line six. Sylvia is listening to us in Palm Springs, California. Sylvia, you're on with Neely Fuller, Jr. Good morning, Carl. Good morning, Dr. Fuller. Um, well, I, I don't really start out with... What I really want to start out with is I've looked up the word supremacy, supreme, and superior, and they all three have the same characteristic definition, and, and that is that there is absolutely nothing better than superior, supreme, or superior. All three of them hold that same characteristic definition. And for me, um, I feel that if there's nothing better than that, then what we need to do is call the system what it really is. It's an inferior system, and I call it inferior because it has never done anything good for black people. It has only worked for white people. And they're the only people that white supremacy has worked for. So if we call the system um, what what it really is, which is an, an, a white inferior system, then that's something that we can correct because supremacy we cannot correct because there's nothing better than that, better than this system. But we can correct uh, an inferior system, a white inferior system. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. And I'm really kind of nervous because I had a lot of things other <clears throat> that I wanted to say about this. But I wanted to also say that the fellow Eric was correct and I'm in complete uh, 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 with him with that. And, and, and with the other thing, that justice, if we're going to replace it, if we're going to replace it with justice, then <clears throat> we, can, we can do that. But we can't replace it something that's supreme, we can replace justice with something that is inferior. And All right, uh, Sylvia, so we, we get to kind of get the gist of your question. Let's give uh, Neely Fuller Jr. a chance to respond. She says she doesn't believe in the word supreme. Is it just a word then, uh, Neely Fuller Jr.? Is she, is she well, on the money or is she off the mark? A word is a tool. All words are nothing but tools. And what are tools for? To accomplish your job. So, uh, what I've written, I've always said that people can use any terms that they want to to do the job that they think needs to be done. I use the term white supremacy because I say that when you start talking about the categories of people, the people who believe in mistreating people based on color are the people who are the supreme powers on this planet which is why we are having black radio, black television. We talk about the black community. We're talking about Black Lives Matter. It's because we have been captured by people who have come up with a supreme system of mistreatment. See, it depends on the context that we're talking about. All right, hang, hang on a second, Sylvia, because we've got to take a quick break. I'll let you finish your question on the other side. Stay with us well. On 1450 WOL. And thank you for rolling with us this morning. And Neely Fuller Jr., one of our top, top scholars, folks, tell your friends to tune us in at WOLDCNews.com or they can use the TuneIn app or, or just download the uh, WOL uh, app. It's free at the app stores, WOL 1450. And get in on this conversation with Neely Fuller Jr. Let's go back to Sylvia on line six. Sylvia is in Palm Springs, California. And Sylvia, your father. Follow up to what Neely Fuller Jr. just said. Yes, and, and my my reason for calling this system or changing the system to an inf to a white inferior system is because first of all, uh, you can't get apple juice if you're going to squeeze lemons, and and 
and we're going to get justice from this system. Who are we going to go to to have them give us justice? Are we going to go to the same white superior, supreme, supremacy people, or are we going to deal with a system that is inferior, that is an unjust system? Uh, if you can just... Uh, if you can just give me some kind of better definition of, of being a white supremacist, because, um, like I say, you can't get, they are an inferior people, so how are you going to get something that's not inferior coming from them? All right, good question. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you for your call. Neely Fuller, Jr.? Well, uh, it depends on context, and it depends on the terms that you want to use. No word means anything until you make it mean something. Words are, are just tools that people make up. Well, uh, I make up words. Supremacy. Hello? Then why call it supremacy? Why not change it into call right. it supremacy? I'm, 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 I'm answer the question. All questions have answers. So the answer to that is we wouldn't be having this conversation if we had overcome the system of white supremacy. We're talking about not good. Sometimes people mistake supreme with good. No, no, no. And this is and and this is excellent. If you're talking about like a supreme being, like in Christianity, that's one context. And you say that God so is supreme. It, in this case, we're calling it a system, and and the system we're calling supreme, superior, supremacy. So that no. means that there is nothing better. There's nothing better than there's nothing better than God. So now we're saying that this system is 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 a uh, it's a, it's a supremacy system or supreme system, and and yet it's an inferior. We get an inferior uh, reaction from it. Okay, well you can do that if that serves your purpose. See, a, a word is nothing but a tool, but it doesn't. I I just made the suggestion of white supremacy because I say that motivates people to get rid of a cancer. You see, cancer can be supreme over me. I mean, if cancer is motivating me, I have to keep going to the doctor and all like that. And the doctor says, well, you're going to keep coming to me because you, this cancer is getting the best of you. This cancer is supreme over you. It's a cancer, and it's supreme. It's gotten you off your job. It's gotten you where you can't function. It's gotten you where you can't do what you want to do. you got to get rid of this cancer. You can't keep playing with it. This Cancer has a grip on you. See, that's the way I look at the system of white supremacy. Now, you might say, oh, the cancer is inferior. But, see, that might prompt you to start thinking, oh, I'm supreme over this cancer. I don't have to do anything. This cancer is, you know, it's nothing. So I'm not going to do nothing. See, and that might be the way that people will go with it. It depends on what it causes you to do. That's all a word means, any word. You can call any word anything, give any word any definition, like I do it all the time. But I do it as a tool. In other words, what when I use this word, what does this word make me do? Because people are motivated by words all over the world every day. People talk to each other. And you can say certain things and you can make somebody angry. Or you can say certain things and you can calm somebody down. Or you can say certain things and you can help a person to think on another level. Words are nothing but tools. So if that tool will serve you by saying that white, rather than white supremacy, say white inferiority, if that motivates you to do more to produce justice, then so be it. Use that term and get other people to do it. But remember, words are nothing but tools, and you only go by the use or the value of a tool by what that tool does, what it results in. All right, now, hang on a second, Neely Floyd Jr. We've got to step aside for a traffic update for our folks in the DMV. We've got a bunch of WMNJ HD2 Bethesda, a Radio 1 station, and worldwide at WOLDCnews.com. The views and opinions of the following show do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of News Talk 1450 WOL, Radio 1 Incorporated, or their management. Welcome to the Carl Nelson Show on Washington, D.C.'s 1450 WOL Radio and live around the world on WOLDCnews.com. 
Right, thank you for staying with us this morning, folks. Our guest is Neely Fuller, Jr., and we're talking about Black Lives Matter, the slogan, and how to survive in a white supremacist world. And i got to tell you, you got to listen really, really keenly when Neely Fuller speaks, because you understand he uses logic to prove everything. Those of you who have taken logic in college, you understand what I'm talking about. 800-450-7876. Go to line one. Ishtar has joined us from Princeton, New Jersey. Ishtar, you're on with Neely Fuller, Jr. Yes, thank you. Um, my question is, uh, um, the lady Sylvia was saying that how, in other words, I think both of you were saying thank you, that words are very important. But listen, I notice when they do construction work, the world tool too, when they do construction work, they tear a building down with a boom. It's a part of the machine, but the boom is a tool. So that that boom tears that building down. And as far as the words again, like the word nigger, that word has been so powerful until it tore us down and it's keeping us down. So the word supremacy, perhaps that should be changed to something else because words are so powerful. I have begun to realize myself that when I say things, it's like we can speak things into existence. So are they giving us the words for themselves? supreme as God, then we call them, though, the words that they are using. And all we're doing is building their energy against them. Um, so I was just, I was there today as something else, but since the subject changed, I went on with this. So, um, doctor, or would you say, what would you say about what I said? I would say that, and I've written, a, I've, I've come up with a term, a mm-hmm. word term, using words again, to handle mm-hmm. situations like we have right now. And mm-hmm. I call it Victims Guaranteed Qualification. In other words, BGQ. That's how I remember it. Mm-hmm. Victims Guaranteed, and it's listed in my word guide, Victims Guaranteed Qualification. And what is that guaranteed qualification? Because I've had these types of discussions, and I've been involved in them, and I've observed them down through the years. And black people sometimes... Many times we get mm-hmm. we get we start confusing ourselves and each other, and we get combative sometimes over the use of words. You know, like the term "Black Lives Matter." Sometimes that can start a big argument, and all that really comes out of it is a big argument between black people about whether or not they should use the word. You know, and white lives matter, and whether or not all lives matter. And then people start arguing about that. And they're just words. So I came up with a term called Victims Guaranteed Qualification, which means anybody who wants to use any term to describe whatever his or her situation is, if that person is black, a victim of white supremacy, mm-hmm. all right, he mm-hmm. or she has not only the privilege but the duty to say whatever he or she wants to say. That's why I'm saying right now about this particular word, so that we don't get, you know, all caught up in it and use three or four hours going back and forth. Use the terms that you think will work best for you. That's it. That keeps black people from getting into these endless arguments that go on and on and on and on in every beauty parlor, in every barbershop, at every meeting and whatnot, going around in a big circle, sometimes just about what words we're going to use. So you give everybody as an individual. You you don't really give it to them. They have it anyway. Use whatever terms you think will work. But what you say is the whole purpose for doing for using words is to to get a job done. So if the, if you say saying that the system of white white supremacy should be changed to a system of white inferiority and and call that system a system of inferiority and that works for you and it works for others, then by all means use it. You don't have to get permission from Neely Full or anybody else. This is what I do when I write a book. I don't get anybody's permission. Indirectly, I get permission from the white supremacists. Otherwise, they would just squash my book. They would just say, we're going to squash your book and you too, because I say that they are supreme. Okay? The white supremacists 
or mm-hmm. supreme, which is why I wrote a book about our problem with white supremacy. But if somebody mm-hmm. else wants to call it by a different name and say, uh, there are some black people who say there's no such thing as white supremacy, and that there's no such thing as racism, that it doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. And I don't get into an argument with people about that. I simply say, oh, well, if you come to the conclusion that racism doesn't exist and that your book is just a whole bunch of nonsense, and there's a lot of people who have said that about my book, say, you're writing about racism. Racism don't even exist, man. That's just in your mind. If you get that out of your mind, you can go on about your business and do what you got to do. Talk about some racism. Ain't nobody telling you what to do. Ain't nobody making you do nothing. You do what you want to do. If you're a real man, I've had people say that to me. And my response has been, I'm not going to argue with you. If you believe that, go with it all the way and see where it will take you. But, but you know, the one thing that it seems like with our people is that Whatever's going to take place, it has to be discussed so strongly. It has to be dissected. It has to be torn apart. And see, it's like we can't get to the point of that. That's what we have to do mainly with these words. It's not like maybe our, or maybe sometimes our, our emotions grow a little stronger. But I, but I'm not making excuses. But I think because when you're an underdog, you you more you attack a little more harder than if you're not. But then that's the only way we're gonna to get to where we should be is by like 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 we all say for them, supremacy. So when we all come together in unit and unite in unity with the same words. Okay, maybe your words have a lot of power then Sylvia's words have a lot of power. But just imagine, once we all come together with the same mind frame, but you, and it's not going to be easy because we're so split apart from one another. So it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of not understanding but understanding. So that's the only way I, I really and truly believe it's going to be done it's true, like um, this lady, I don't know if you, any of you heard of Grand Goddess Gia, but the one thing she said, like the churches and people that don't, aren't even in the church, they say worship. She said it's not worship, it's wordship. And I've seen, like I was saying, I've seen myself just use words, and I've seen the presence take place because of that. So all I'm saying is that, so if we all start learning how to come together. See, we have no unity, but when we all start coming together, as simple as something as a lot of people would say, just the word, but it's just the word is a word is a word. And if we could come together on that, guess what? Our DNA would start performing for us, and the stuff that is, it would not be anymore. That's how powerful we, powerful we are in just words. But thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Ishita. And, and, and maybe for the journey, do we all have to have, reach a consensus on, on the definition of the word supremacy? Because I think that's what was hanging up a lot of people. And, and Dr. Welsing mentions it, too. The system, she says, it's a system of white supremacy. And people tell her, oh, she's talking about white people. The same thing that uh, I think Sylvia was implying, that you're saying that white people are supreme or better than us. Yeah. No, I'm um, what I am saying, and that's why I said every word, words don't mean anything. No word means anything until you give it a definition. And so I give the term white supremacy a definition. All right, hold that thought oh, right there. Yes. And we've got a bunch of folks who want to speak to you. Neely Fuller Jr. W-O-L. And thank you for staying with us and our guest, Neely Fuller Jr. Again, the number to call to reach Neely Fuller Jr., 800-450-7876, the Black Lives Matter slogan or not, and how to survive in a white supremacist world. That's what we're discussing with Neely Fuller Jr. i seen a lot of people hung up on the word supremacy. But let's go to line two. Uh, Tina's joining us from D.C. Tina, you're on with Neely Fuller Jr. Oh, yes. Um, oh, maybe I should turn my car off. Yes. Um, I uh, was very interested when you you were speaking about uh, the different categories. Um, uh, and I, I thought to myself, well, the different categories are divisions of people um, into races. It, 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 that right there, it just speaks to the very existence of racism. 
because if we were just um, equal people, perhaps maybe the categories would be male, female, or if you're American or French or African or something like that. And, you know, it, it, it's like like the divide and conquer in its best definition. And um, um, though some have, you know, tried to, 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 to bring a positive element to, the, to this uh, categorization, you know, by awarding help where needed since we are in a racist society and um, lives are, are not equal. I, I just thought that that was very interesting, uh, you know, when you were discussing uh, how the, the different, there are about 21 categories or something like that. And, and, you know, it wasn't that at first, and, and it started out with a small amount of, of divisions, and it just gets bigger and bigger. I, I, it's just kind of fascinating how we're just held um, captive to uh, uh, certain thoughts or philosophy, idealist, I mean, um, ideals or whatever you would call right. it. Tina, you have a question in there so he can respond? Yes, I'm, I'm like, I, why, um, I'm, I'm just, do you think that that right there kind of speaks, I mean, that's the evidence right there that, that, that there is racism because we are divided up it, by race on paper everywhere we go. I mean, every job, every school, every, everything, they want to know what race you are. So, I mean, why do we have to be defined by race? I mean, isn't that like just like the proof right there? It's a racist uh, uh, setup. All right, let's give him a chance to respond. Thanks, Tina. Neely Ford, Jr.? That is what I wrote my book for. There's not supposed to be any such thing as race. Race is racism. Uh, and it was thought up according to the evidence, by somebody who believed in something called white supremacy. And the white supremacists set up the categories for everybody else. They, first of all, according to the evidence, some white person, person who called him or herself white, sometime in the past, I don't know when, some people say it goes back 400 years, some say 600 years, some say 2,000 years. I say I don't know because I don't know. And somebody else can research that and find out who was the first person who got the idea of a thing called racism, which means literally mistreating people based on color. That's all it's good for. It's not good for anything else. When you say you want to belong to a race, all you're really saying is you want to mistreat people based on color. Why? Mm -hmm. Because you can join a club or sorority or fraternity or union to do other things, but if you're going to belong to a race, it means you are getting ready to mistreat people based on color. Non-white people didn't call themselves by any racial names. They called themselves by tribal names. I mean, Zulu, Al Guankin, uh, Chickasaw, uh, Chickasha, uh, Creek, Cherokee, Apache, uh, Watusi. These are the titles that people call themselves, or by so-called family names, just your ordinary names for each individual person. But sometimes in the past, some person, presumably a person who is now categorized as white, said, you know what, it would be a good idea to classify people by something called race or racism. And we will have a system set up called racism where people will be categorized not by height or weight or education or anything else, but simply by color. And it will be designed to dominate people. If you're classified as white, you will dominate everybody who you say is non-white. And even that will shift around every now and then in variations. But white will be the category that's always at the top. Somebody thought of this idea, and the evidence shows it, because that's what we're wrestling with right down to this day. So evolved into something called a system of white supremacy. And that's what they called it. I went with it 
because it's an indictment of the people who started this. And I use it as an indictment. And I don't want to change that now, saying that this system doesn't exist or that the system itself is inferior because as a system, even though it's evil, it is not inferior. It is superior to the people who are the victims of it. Otherwise, the people couldn't be victims. That's why I hold on to it tenaciously. Now, other people, if they want to use other terms and say, like a lot of people say, well, this white supremacy thing, full of, stop calling it that. Ain't nobody supreme. I say, oh, well, then if ain't nobody supreme, ain't nobody telling nobody else what to do, if nobody's mistreating anybody, then what are you going to call it? I mean, you know, you can call it whatever you want to call it, but are you saying that people are not being mistreated? And who are the people who are not being mistreated based on color? When you just get, got through saying you got turned down for a job based on color, what are you going to call it? You say, well, if you want to, and, and getting back, back to this conversation we're having today, if you want to call it by some other term, I'm saying, rather than just keep arguing about the terms that we're using, use any terms that you want to. I came to that conclusion a long time ago. I'm going to stick with the term white supremacy because it works for me. When I say that to white people, they know exactly what I'm talking about, and I'm using it as an indictment. But if I go to them now and say white inferiority, they will say, well, what are you talking about? Are you saying we're inferior? And then I will have to say, yes. And then you say, okay, inferior to whom? And how are we inferior? See, that, that, that goes into a whole other different type of question, line of questioning. And then I have to ask myself, am I really getting what I'm, uh, what I'm after by doing this? I changed the word from white supremacy to white inferiority. Now when I talk to white people, I start telling them how inferior they are, and they'll say, they might even agree with me. Say, oh, yeah, we're inferior. And so now, what's your argument? You're saying that we're inferior and we're telling you what to do? I mean, it's a contradiction here. I mean, make up your mind, boy. I mean, you know, we're either telling you what to do or we're not. I'm not right, Hold that thought right there, Nina Fuller Jr., because we've got to step aside for a couple of announcements and come back and take some more calls for you. So, number one on everybody list, Carl Nelson on 1450 WOL. I don't even stand with All the lines are lit. We'll try to get to as many people as possible. We've got questions about Neely Fuller Jr. and the system of white supremacy. And that's why I told you, you've got to listen really, really keenly to what Neely Fuller is saying. Also, what Dr. Francis S. Wilson, when she talks about the system of white supremacy, because, uh, you know, a lot of people don't get it for us to get hung up on the word supreme and that's why I, you know we keep bringing back neely fuller and also dr wilson to explain it because once you understand it folks then you understand just about everything if you don't everything else will confuse you 800-450-7876 we're 27 minutes away from the top of the hour let's go to line six rick is joining us from ontario canada rick you're on with neely fuller jr good morning uh can you hear me call loud and clear good uh good morning dr fuller um, I, I, I've got, I, I want to say, you know, once I spent about three hours trying to release a bolt and a fan torn in my car, and I wasn't getting anywhere with it, and so I finally took it to a Volvo technician. And he reached into his toolkit and got a tool specifically for removing that bolt, and he removed it in about two, and it reminded me of a statement my father had made to me many years ago that if you have the right tool, you can accomplish anything. Uh, when I listen to many of the comments, it is similar to when one speaks to a teenager, usually, who doesn't want to accept the reality of their actions. So that teenager acts like they don't understand what you're saying, because if they do, then they have no real argument against the truth of what the matter is. Now, I, I'm of the mind that many people who hear what is being stated by Dr. Fuller and other notable people, such as Dr. Francis Cross Welsing, who you just mentioned, they're simply afraid or somehow have been immobilized by an internal, inculcated fear of having the power to actually change the way we do things, since it's scientific, you know, to properly appreciate that, like he says, every question has an answer, every problem has a solution, one simply has to find it and implement it. So since words are tools, 
and in effect can be seen as powerful if they're used properly, I, I think we should stop calling white people white when, in fact, they are pink, regardless of how that makes someone feel to say it or to hear it. The word white has a social and imagery meaning in the English language because it defines as something that's good or pure. And, Carl, you know as well as I, the history of these pink people demonstrates nothing good or pure. Rather, they are evil and reprobate. So what I understand is Dr. Fuller is annotating a code to counteract this constant assault on our psyche, and therefore it will promote our existence as human beings being responsible for our destiny. So I'm, I'm going to leave with this question for Dr. Fuller and whatever comments he'd like to make. Is it fear that ultimately causes black people so inclined to argue about incidentals instead of adopting the compensatory code that you speak of or tools as a way to change and counteract the assault on us and therefore change the way we live and so that we can enjoy life. Yes, we need a code for everything. The white supremacists, if if people will permit me to use that term, because I'm not going to move from it. I've had all kinds of suggestions down through the decades about, Mm -hmm. stop saying white supremacy. And I'm going to say, no, I'm going to say it because it works. When you actually use it, it works. You may not think that it works, but it works. White people don't like that term even though they are the ones that gave it to me. I never heard this term, white supremacy, until I heard it from white people. They were bragging about the use of it. But I stick with what they're bragging about, because one thing, it's true. Okay? Supreme just means a person can tell me what to do, and I don't know what to do about it, and I don't want to do it. But I still have to do it, because I don't know what to do about it. That's all supreme means. Okay? And if you base that on being white, and you are able to pull it off, then that's true. Now, I say in order to solve a problem, you first have to recognize it is a problem, even though the problem is more powerful than I am. I can't walk around in jail saying I'm not a prisoner because it makes me feel better. Many black people want to feel better instantly. That is natural. I fully understand that. But if you're a prisoner of war and you decide why you're a prisoner, you know what? I'm going to stop calling myself a prisoner. I'm going to say that I'm a king. I ain't no prisoner. I'm a king. And that warden, he's the prisoner. Look, he's on the other side of the bars. See? So he's, he's my prisoner. I got him in jail. That's why he's here. He's right here with me. And so that makes me feel better. Sure, that's a big temptation, but that doesn't motivate you to tear down and prison walls. See what I mean? Because that's what I'm trying to get to do. And that takes some courage, and that takes admission of the truth, that we have been beaten. We're not just walking around doing whatever we want to do, the black people of this planet. We have already been beaten. But we need to get some adrenaline going to fight against the thing that has conquered us. Because it's what? Evil. And it needs to be replaced. We're not just trying to survive in this system. No. We are trying to dismantle the entire system. Or we should be. And any time that's not our objective, then we have no business doing anything. We're not carrying out our assignment according to the way that I look at it. We are here on an assignment, the assignment of the people of this planet, all people, white and non-white, is to solve problems. Racism is a problem, and I say it's the biggest problem. I say you can't solve any problem until you solve the problem of this thing called racism in the form of white supremacy. And then you can begin to solve all the other problems. And I've come up with a code of suggestions for what each individual person can do, and you can get the book called Produce Justice by going to ProduceJustice.com. That's just my little quote-unquote contribution of suggestions. That's all they are, suggestions. I have used some of them myself, 
they have worked for me. Now, other people can use them if they want to. If they don't, they can come up with what their suggestions are. That's why I have the VGQ factor, which I say is very important. In this discussion that we're having right now, we've taken up for the whole two hours just talking about what are we going to call it. We started off talking about Black Lives Matter. Then we started talking about we need to stop using this term white supremacy. And we have spent two hours talking about this term white supremacy. Let's call it something else or let's not call it anything. Well, everybody is free to do that. But I say that I have attempted to do these things. And I, many years ago, after all kind of studying and going to all kinds of seminars where people talked all day, sometimes a three-day seminar and all like that, I said, hey, I'm going to stick with what I know works. I'm going to stick with what I know works. Now, other people can stick with what they think works. That's okay. I have no argument against that. Try it out. See how far you can go with it. See what the results are. Every time I use this term, I have found that it works for me in every seminar. I freeze everybody else. That's my experience. And I have told other people, try it on for size. If it doesn't work, don't use it. Try it on for size. Everything that I've written in the book, try it on for size. If it doesn't work, don't use it. All right, hold that thought right there, Nina, for Jimmy. Rick, thank you. Weekdays from 6 to 10 a.m. on 1450 WOL. And thank you for rolling with us and our guest, Nina Fuller Jr. And with number to call, heading on this discussion, Nina Fuller Jr., 800-450-7876. Go to line three. Brother Bay, Brother Bay, thank you for being so patient. Hoping you're still there with us. Good morning. Yes, you're on the air with Nina Fuller Jr. Yes, sir. Uh, I was going to speak on the Black Lives Matter. First of all, I, I believe it's a feel-good movement. Uh, I don't want to put a lot of crews into it. Uh, I understand it's being bankrolled somewhat by the Koch brothers. That's the comment number one. Number two, if Black Lives really matter, then the president wouldn't have signed Executive Order 13603. That's number two. And my third comment is that white supremacy is a business. Until we understand it's a business, we'll never get to the root of white, what is white supremacy. It's a business. If you look at all the colleges and you see all the players that's on, on Alabama, Ohio State, the, the stars are black. They go down and see Aunt so-and-so and Uncle, I forgot his name, and Grandma uh, to get them to sign their child to go to these schools. And you're looking at white supremacy every Sunday. I mean, every Saturday that these college games are on, it's right there in front of your face. It is a business. This is why they keep preaching white supremacy. It's a business. Until we understand, they're making money off of this. The whites are making money. It's a business. And thank you. All right. Let's get Neely Fuller to respond. He says the white supremacy is a business. Is it a business? Is it solely a business? Is it all about money? Why, why they adopt that, that stance of white supremacy? Well... If the gentleman uh, takes that position, that's what it is. But what I have written uh, in using the word business, I said white supremacy is the business of the entire world, which means what? Mistreating people based on color. That's the business that they have chosen, and they have made it the most successful business that the world has ever seen. I'm talking about worldwide in all areas of activity. 24 hours a day, and it applies to all people, white and non-white. It's the biggest business that the world has ever seen, and that's why I give it that title, the business of white supremacy, but I call it the system of white supremacy, which is the same thing. All businesses must show a profit. So the business of white supremacy is it gives every white person from even before birth the opportunity to walk around on the planet and say there are a category of people called black, brown, red, yellow, or and or non-white that I can mistreat for my benefit. That's what every white person is taught on this planet by the people who came before them who believe in mistreating people based on color. Now, that doesn't mean all white people. 
but it means a huge number of white people. And these white people apparently are more powerful than the people who don't believe in racism. This is why we have white supremacy, because there are white people who say they don't believe in any white supremacy and all like that. But when they try to talk against white supremacy, the white people themselves then they are shouted down by the white people who believe in white supremacy. And the shouting sometimes is very quiet. Well, let me interrupt you and ask you this. Are you referring to white privilege? Is that the same thing? Same thing. People have all kinds of terms for it, just like we've been talking about today. I mean, even not even using the term and calling it by some other term. But do you still have that as a fact? And the fact says you have people who are dominating the non-white people, the black, brown, red, and yellow people of this planet, who are white, who believe in you have a license, and not only a license, but a duty to mistreat people if they have color in their skin. That's all racism is. It does serves no other purpose other than that. Mistreating people based on color. That's what it's for. And it's the most successful business if you want to use the word business, on this planet, in what? Successful in what? Successful in all areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. When a person who has color in his or her skin stands up and says, Well, I believe the education system should be thus and so, that we should teach this, we should teach that. When the white supremacists stand up, they say, well, I believe that what you just said ain't going to happen, and I got the muscle to back it up. And then the non-white person says, well, you're overruling me? Yes, I'm overruling you. Well, that's not right, and uh, I'm protesting, yes. But who are you protesting to? Because I'm the person you have to protest to. I'm a white supremacist. You are one of my victims. So there, duh, wake up and smell the coffee, boy. All right. 800-450-7876. Thank you, Brother Bay. Yes, sir. Line one. CP's in South Central Los Angeles. CP, you're on with Neely Fuller, Jr. Uh, Yes. Tyler, the morning. Uh, Carl, thanks for taking my call. And uh, Dr. Lee Phil Jr., I enjoy you as always. Uh, you bring out some good points, but most of all, you define it in a way you and Dr. Chris Wilson and a lot of other people haven't defined it because I never gave much power to it. We used to uh, put the mirror thing up to my neighborhood when they passed by and call us that, and we call them that. So I've never really given any power, but it has stagnated people. Carl, I want to I want to know if you're Dr. Phil or listen to his book, Warren, last night. Warren is her last name? She spoke, I mean, she pumped it up about racism. She talked about it in a right, I'll tell you what, make it quick for us, CP, because we're running out of time. We've got a bunch of folks who want to speak to Neely Fuller Jr. So put in a question for well, I, I don't want to say too much, Carl. I don't want to say what I want to say. I just want to thank him again for having it having on. Uh, let them know we appreciate it. Thank you. All right, 800-450-7876, line two. Charles is calling us from D.C. Charles, Joe Neely Fuller, Jr. Uh, I think Charles has left us. Let's go to line five. Ernest is in b Ernest? And Ernest has gone, too, so let's go to line four. Lawrence is in Arlington, Texas. Lawrence. Uh, thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, good morning, my brother. Hey. Uh, Neely, here's one thing, you know, that I wanted to take issue with. You know, I've been sitting here listening to you, and, you know, I, I, I want to first of all say, look, my brother, there, there's nothing I can't say but respect. I respect you because anybody who didn't live as long as you, me, Kyle, we got to give respect to each other. But I'm going to tell you, I have one thing that I want to put across to you, my brother, and I want you to respond to it. When you're – when when you said that we are prisoners, I take I take umbrage with that. In order to be a prisoner, you got to surrender mentally as well as physically. Now, any time a black person considers themselves a prisoner, the person who you are surrendering to 
can do whatever the hell they want with you. If you don't surrender, surrender mentally, you are never a prisoner. Even if they take your life, you are not a prisoner. When you tell people to do whatever the police tell you tell them to do, and then you qualify that statement, they still might kill you. That 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 nullifies everything that you said before that. And the reason why I say that is this. Whenever you have an encounter with the police as a black person, it's, it can potentially be a life and death struggle. You're supposed to enter into that confrontation or that engagement on the basis, like you said, I agree with you, be respectful, but also be ready to defend your life to the fullest. And if that means doing whatever it takes, then that's what you do. And that has nothing to do with surrendering. Now, when you come at a police or when the police come at you as a black man and I interact with these suckers and I have to deal with them and I have this kind of conversation with white cops, senior white cops, and my point is this. I don't. I tell them, first of all, you are not my enemy and I'm not yours. Lawrence, well, in the interest of time, because we're, we're racing the clock here, put in a question for him so he can respond. Well, nearly here's the question. Don't you think you're doing? Don't you think you you're doing a, a a disservice to all us black people when you tell us to do what you say? Because the bottom line of it is, if we are in a war, there is no surrendering. There is either victory or death. There is no surrendering when you're in a war. So when you say do whatever these police tell you to do, don't you think you kind of like uh, muttering muttering the water and confusing people? I'm not. All right, let's, let's give him a chance to respond because we're running out of time. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, he says you're muddying the water. You're confusing folks. And Neely Fuller Jr., your, your response. My response is, okay, I said don't argue, don't fight, don't run. One, two, three, just like that, because that's what I do. I don't argue, I don't fight, I don't run. It's work for me. Now, there are people who say argue, fight, Run, kill. They'll add that. Hey, when it, when you get pulled over, jump out with your stuff smoking. In other words, your gun's blazing. This is war. If you want to take that position, then take it. See what I mean? I'm not preventing anybody from doing anything. I'm saying Neely Fuller does not argue, does not fight, and does not run. Now, why is this? Because Neely Fuller has found that it works for him. I've done it. I didn't argue, I didn't fight, and I didn't run. And I was able to get some things done later on in a way where I came out ahead. It was later on. I couldn't do anything then. So I didn't argue, I didn't fight, and I didn't run. I bided my time as a prisoner of war. And I acted like a prisoner of war. And it worked for me. Now, if it doesn't work for the next person, if you want to come out of the car with your guns blazing, go ahead. Be my guest. All right. Hold that thought right there. 800-450-7876. Nearly full of Jenner, our guest. Next on 1450. WOL, where information is power. PRS HD2 Waldorf, WKYS HD2 Washington, WMMJ HD2 Bethesda, a Radio 1 station, and worldwide at WOLDCnews.com. The views and opinions of the following show do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of News Talk 1450 WOL, Radio 1 Incorporated, or their management. The following is a paid advertisement.